Thanks everyone for joining us today at Online Life Event to Learn. I'm the host from AI Camp. Before we get started, just want to do a quick introduce on AI Camp. We are a global online platform for developer, engineer, and data scientists to learn and practice AI technology. With the mission of the make AI app available to all developers, AI Camp have grown to over 5,000 technology engineers in the group, have hosted over 300 local tech meetup, workshop, boot camp, large tech conference, and live stream most of the tech talk globals. We have local study group in most major city in the US, a few city in Europe, India, China, Australia. You can take a quick you can take a look at the website to see our upcoming tech talk, workshop, and the crash course that we offer. Here are the webinar we have for upco upcoming week. This Friday at 10, 10 o'clock, we have the training and the serving out training model on, on Cognite. Next Monday at 10 o'clock, we have building G GAN with ProTouch. Next Friday, we have built your, uh, built your first AI chatbot workshop. Most importantly, we will hold our AI Maxcom Seattle conference from January 23 to 26. And the most important is buy the ticket before this Friday to get 50% off. And we are excited to have Martin, Google Cloud developer, advocate. And today we will follow the story of the fiction startup in Jest, publisher of the N publisher an app that tell jokes. At first, the developer at the ingest need to get minimum minimum valuable product up and running in an hour. As their business grows, they will have to integrate with Google Sheets, SQL database, analyst systems, marketing system, and so on. We will see the code used to make this happen without having to worry the team about service and data centers. Before we get started, just want to tell you a little background about Martin. She is a Google Cloud Developer Advocate. She advocates Google app to developer and leads the team that provides the day-to-day -day tech support to those developers. He compounds business and people skill with deep technical knowledge. Specialists, search advertising, payment, processing. And without further ado, let's welcome Martin. Hey, thank you, Micah. Uh, Martin here, and thank you for that introduction. So yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, focusing on your code and not your infrastructure. And this is something that we all need code uh, to run uh, our, our things in the cloud. If we do machine learning, for example, we need some sort of scaffold that calls our uh, machine learning code and, and models. Uh, and uh, rather than talk in theory about what uh, what this, uh, let's see, um, this was, okay, I think I'm sharing my screen now. There we go. Uh, so rather than uh, talking in theory about uh, what the this products uh, and Google Cloud Platform do, I will actually go through an example and uh, with a fictional startup and it's how they over time gradually builds out their application and uh, we will um, um, uh, in the next 30 minutes or so we'll see what they build out and uh, how they use cloud uh, functions for that um, and uh, then i'll take your questions first off uh, we have this is what i look like i don't have a camera on right now but this is what i look like when i wear a denim jacket today i'm wearing a a pink shirt button down shirt you can imagine that in your minds if you want to imagine what i look like my name is martin and i was born and raised in sweden i lived in silicon valley for these 19 years and uh, i'm actually calling in from mountain view california right now 
I've worked at three startups as a software engineer before Google, and then I've been at uh, Google for the last uh, 12 years. And uh, let's see, should I? Oh. Hmm. Uh, I've been, uh, and I'm a cloud developer advocate right now. So I um, uh, work with, I have two jobs, really. One, as a cloud developer advocate, one is to tell you guys, great developers like you all, about cloud, Google Cloud Platform and the cool things you can you do with it. And the second job is to take your input and feedback and feed that back to the engineers and product managers who build the product, the cloud platform, so that we can make it even better. So the, uh, the um, app we're talking about today, or the startup we're talking about today, is it's Beth's startup. It's a fictional startup. Beth, she has a, a mission, spread joy to the world. She's a developer. Now, how can she do that? With, how can she spread joy to the world with code? Well, she figures out this, she has this idea. What if I, she pictures uh, the typical user of her service that she's going to build. She pictures the typical user to be Alice. Alice has a very, very simple use case. Alice can send a text message to Beth's service, and then Alice will get a text message back with a joke. So super simple service. It'll make the world a happier place. Beth wants to build this. Now, how should she go about that? Well, uh, if you go out there and you read up on building scalable web systems and building systems that are highly available, uh, when Beth does that, when you've done that, you may come across uh, things like this. This is the Wikipedia network architecture. So there's something like 27, 30 boxes in here, various databases feeding each other, uh, various things that if certain things go down, others will take over the load. There's caching, replication. This is kind of uh, complicated. And for a lot of the stuff that you build, that I build, that we all build, and that Beth is going to build, all of this is overkill. If, if Beth went down the route of, of uh, building out this thing by herself, she would spend a, one or two years building out this amazing infrastructure before she even got to writing the service, which is to send jokes to users. So instead, there is another um, approach that is perhaps more applicable to startups and to uh, companies that want to move quickly, and that is microservices. So Beth imagines that Alice will send an SMS message and that uh, Beth will use the Twilio gateway for that. If um, you haven't used Twilio before, they're a great company. They are not affiliated with Google, but I use them for a lot of my apps. They basically take SMS messages and convert them to HTTP that can then hit your microservices. And by the same token, you can return, when they hit your microservice with an HTTP call, when whatever you return, that will, they, Twilio will send that back as a responding text message to the user. So this two boxes is a lot more palatable than the 27 boxes we had in the previous um, diagram. Now, how do we get to using only two boxes? Well, let's start writing some code. Uh, this is going to be, you'll see some JavaScript code here. This is what Beth writes to write her very version 1.0 or maybe even version 0.1 of her new uh, startup that uh, sends jokes to users. So uh, first she just needs to do some imports. This is Twilio libraries she's importing. Then she declares the uh, function and exports that function. This function is called reply. That is the function that uh, Google will execute. Uh, she will need to create a messaging response. Needs to, she needs to put the joke in it because uh, she is uh, going to return with a response here. And then here, this is a bit of rigmarole you need to do here just to respond with a status 200, respond with XML because that's what Twilio wants. 
and then um, send back the response. So this, this code, Beth will deploy as a Google Cloud function on the Google Cloud platform. She will then point Twilio to this code. And she's telling Twilio, dear Twilio, whenever an SMS comes into my phone number, hit this HTTP endpoint. Twilio will dutifully do that. When they do that, this code will be triggered running on Google Cloud Platform. This code will pick a random joke and send it back to Twilio. And Twilio will send that joke uh, back as an SMS text message to the user. Now, if, if you, and, and this code, by the way, it's JavaScript. You might recognize if you work with node.js, this is node style JavaScript, server side JavaScript. So it's very easy to build something like this. Uh, you write it, Beth would write this in her text editor, and then use a command line uh, command and, uh, to, to deploy this into her Google Cloud account. And she's up and running. Now, if you're really uh, sharp eyed here, you will notice that there's one thing missing here. There is actually a function here that Beth is calling that she hasn't declared. I'll take a moment, see if you can find it. It is, um, it is the get joke function, which is right here. Um, so this one is very simple. It just returns a random joke out of the database of jokes that Beth has. Let's have a look what that could look like. So I'm uh, preparing you. This code is not going to win any beauty contests. But Beth puts it together because she needs to put together an MVP very quickly. And, um, and this code works. So she just declares a, um, an array here and uh, an array of jokes. So her, start, her first MVP starts with only three jokes, not a big database of jokes. And then the get joke function, all that does is it picks a random index in this array, and then it returns the string at that uh, uh, index. So all it does is take one of these three jokes and returns a random joke. OK, not very pretty code, but it means that she gets off the ground quickly. And the code we saw on this screen plus the code on the previous screen that is literally all that Beth needs to write to deploy a scalable uh, cloud function, a scalable service that can take you know, millions of requests per day or zero requests per day. And she will be charged per invocation. She won't be charged per uh, having a server running at all times. So very easy to get started with. This service, now this code here, what is this? Like 12, 15 lines of code. She can now deploy this, show off the service to investors. Investors are very excited about this, um, this service and say, Beth, this is great. But you know what? You will need more than three jokes if, we're gonna, um, if this is going to be a great service. So here's, uh, here's some uh, angel funding. And um, you can uh, go and uh, get more jokes into your database. OK, great. Beth goes, uh, uses that money to hire Charles, the writer. He's in the lower right-hand corner here. Charles, he is great at coming up with jokes, or perhaps going on the internet and copying good jokes. We don't really know. He comes up with jokes all the time, new jokes that he wants Beth to add. So remember. She has a, an array here of three jokes. Uh, but Charles, he comes up with new ones. So he says, hey, Beth, Beth, I found this great joke here. Um, can you put it in? And Beth, she dutifully goes in, adds uh, another element to this array here. So now there's four uh, elements in, in the array. And she's deployed the new joke. And she runs the command line. It's a single command she deploys, so it's not too bad. Five minutes later, uh, Charles comes around and says, hey, hey, Beth, I have this other great joke. Can you deploy this one? Beth dutifully deploys that new one. Now she has an array of five jokes. Next day, Charles comes around and says, oh, oh, Beth, you know, 
that joke you deployed yesterday, right before we left the office, there was a misspelling in that. Can you fix that? Sure, Beth fixes the code, the array, and, and deploys. At this point, Beth is getting a little annoyed. She is in the loop for deploying new jokes here, new content to the microservice. This is not a good place to be, and Beth wants to do business development and maybe write a mobile app and hire other people, all those things you need to do in a company. But you can't because she's stuck deploying new jokes. So while the code we just saw was excellent for getting the service off the ground, now that uh, she has a content writer, Charles, it's not, this code is not that great anymore. She needs a more scalable approach. So she looks through some Google APIs and she figures, oh, what if we do this? What, what, uh, what about, uh, Charles, she says, what about uh, I give you a spreadsheet and you just enter your jokes in the spreadsheet. And then I'm not in the loop. You can enter, edit, delete. If you find misspellings in old jokes, you can fix those, uh, rearrange the jokes any way you want. Charles loves this. Great spreadsheet. I won't have to come and ask you all the time to deploy new jokes. By the way, uh, my favorite joke in this uh, spreadsheet here is number 10. What's good about Switzerland? I don't know, but the flag is a big plus. It's, uh, my daughter has uh, tried to get me to promise not to show these dad jokes, but I'm doing it anyway. Now Charles can fill this out, and uh, what we now have is Charles over here filling out, uh, adding jokes, and uh, let's do this. Yay, cool. It's Charles over here uh, deploying jokes to the spreadsheet. The code in the microservice will need to change a little bit because it will need to pick, to uh, go and read the Google Sheet and then return uh, the right joke and so it can go out to Alice the user. Let's have a look and see what the code up here, what that looks like. So uh, we would, uh, Beth would uh, import the Google APIs. These are APIs that uh, hit, that you can use to hit all Google services. For example, this, um, she uses it here to hit the Google Sheets API to read and write spreadsheets. But this, you can also use this library to hit Google's machine learning APIs. All right, so now getJoke is an asynchronous function because reading uh, from spreadsheets is an asynchronous uh, operation. This is really cool what we see right here. Because um, this code runs on the server inside Beth's cloud project, she doesn't need to deal with OAuth tokens or secrets or passwords or anything like that. She just says, you know, this is the boilerplate code she put in. I want a client that uh, can use this, the spreadsheet's scope. And then, uh, and then um, uh, given, if, if she is given access in that spreadsheet, for this application, it just works. She doesn't deal, need to deal with um, uh, secrets management. All right, then she just needs to create the, um, the API object, call the API object. Here she calls spreadsheets.values.get. And uh, this function, this will return a two-dimensional array of cells from a spreadsheet. Uh, Google here does need to know what spreadsheet to hit. This spreadsheet ID, if you use Google Spreadsheets, if you look in the URL, you will see that there's a long ID up there. That, that is this ID, the, the, the ID of the spreadsheet. You will also need to tell Google what range, which cells to read. So here we're reading from sheet one. We're reading the entire, all contents from column A. Okay, so now she has had a response back. Uh, then, as I mentioned before, this, the response will be a two-dimensional array. So this is just a bit of JavaScript trickery to make a two-dimensional array into a one-dimensional array. Why does she want a one-dimensional array? Well, she wants it because you recognize this, our old friend, uh, are the code that just picks a random index in that one-dimensional array of jokes. And then she returns the joke at that position in the spreadsheet. So, 
this is great. It's a, maybe a little more code, but now it all runs without Beth being in the loop. Charles, the writer, is out here writing, and um, Beth is not up here. The sheet takes care of it all. Great. This runs for, uh, for, for months. It's working very well, this code. But after a few months, um, Charles has been really good, by the way. He has added hundreds of jokes. Everything worked great. He's added thousands of jokes. Everything worked great. When he gets to the point where he, Charles has added tens of thousands of jokes, then sheets may not be the right solution. We're getting, we're getting a bit of a slowdown here. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes things slow down for users. So it takes a long time. And we know why, we can guess why that is. The code, if you remember, it read all of column A from the spreadsheet. So, and then it, it, if there are 10,000 jokes in that column, it would read all 10,000 jokes, ferry, read, ferry them over here to the microservice. The microservice here would pick one of those 10,000 jokes, discard the other 9,999, and then return that one lucky joke over to Twilio which we'll send it to as the user. So sometimes slow, not good. Uh, what can we do to fix this? Well, typically when you want more scale in a system, you can put in a database. So uh, Beth is uh, used to SQL. So she sees that in the cloud platform, Google's cloud platform, there is a SQL product. Uh, there are actually several, but but the one uh, that seems applicable here is Cloud SQL. She likes that because that is a SQL database that speaks MySQL, the MySQL dialect. For those of you who like uh, Postgres, there is that uh, alternative as well. So now the microservice will change just a little bit because it will read over a socket here, read from Cloud to SQL, and then uh, get, get the jo a joke back. There will also need to be code here to export from Sheets to Cloud SQL at regular intervals. Let's look at the code up here for the microservice to read a random joke. Um, we have the get joke function. Here is SQL, and uh, this is, uh, I have not invented this. I've gone on Stack Overflow and I searched for, uh, <coughs> for code, SQL code, to get a random uh, element from a table. So here we're getting a random row, or actually the, the, the joke column only, from a random row from the jokes table. Order by rand limit one, that gives you the random, one random row out of the tens of thousands of rows that could be. And then we need to do a bit of promise trickery. Those of you who worked with uh, JavaScript, uh, know modern JavaScript, know that promises is a way to do asynchronous things. Um, you will uh, call the get db pool uh, code here. This is standard code that you would pull from Google's website. It just gives you a co database connection. Then you call a query on that, um, enter your SQL into it as a parameter, and then uh, the, we'll get back result and array. We return the zero element of that, and that will be the data that came back, the random joke. And that's it. So. Even less code, very nice. This code, by the way, I, I've tried it. Uh, if you have a database of tens, of tens of thousands of jokes, this is lightning fast. Because, uh, because Cloud SQL, MySQL, has been optimized for this sort of thing. Pick one uh, row in a column, in, in a table. All right, this is looking pretty good. Uh, we now have a microservice here that returns uh, random jokes. We have a database, very scalable database, uh, that you can do all kinds of things with. Like she can take snapshots of this database or do backups or replicate if she wants to because of, because of the power of SQL databases. There is an admin uh, interface here in the form of Google Sheets. So Beth did not have to build a special administrative interface for Charles to enter data. This, by the way, is something that uh, I see uh, a lot of developers struggle with. They build big 
administrative interfaces for their internal users when they could just let their internal users, like Charles, uh, use Google Sheets and then just use the code, the um, uh, Google APIs to read from that spreadsheet. And you have your admin interface for free. All of this code runs as Google Cloud Functions, or rather this microservice does. So it's a single command line to, to command to deploy it. Everything is good. Beth is getting more funding. So uh, the uh, investors really like where this is going. Uh, so uh, they ask, uh, uh, OK, be smarter about what you do. We need some analytics on this. So um, Beth hires uh, Daphne. And uh, Daphne is a data analyst. So she comes in here and she asks Charles, when are, most users, when are users most active? When? During the day. After which jokes do users request more jokes? Which are the, who are the most active users, least active users? All that stuff Daphne needs to know so that she can tell Beth how to optimize the service. She asks Charles about this data. He, Charles, has no idea. Because uh, he says, well, I don't know. I have a sheet here. I enter my jokes in it. I don't see all this data. So Daphne goes to Beth, Beth, the programmer, and asks, hey, uh, I all need all this data. Where can I get it from? Now, at this point, Beth has a choice to make. She could potentially build something into this microservice here. But she, th that, uh, that will log this data, who requested the joke, at what time did they request a joke, which joke did they get. But Beth doesn't really want to mess with this service here. Because if there's a bug in the tracking code, if that bug sits on the critical execution path up here in this microservice, that could just mess up the whole service and break the service so that users won't get jokes sent to them. Rather, she wants some separation. Also, she knows that, um, that Daphne, she might change uh, the database and tables and so on for the analytics database. So um, um, Beth doesn't want that, those changes in names and, and analytics technologies to impact this microservice. How do we loosely couple these services, analytics and the production service for users? How do we loosely couple them so that one can't take down the other. And so that Daphne can build her analytics uh, independent from Beth, who builds this microservice. One way of doing that uh, is to use a um, public subscribe mechanism. This is, uh, there is a product in the cloud platform called PubSub, Cloud PubSub. It's basically a messaging bus where you uh, any service, any piece of code, doesn't have to run on the Google Cloud Platform even, can publish a message. And then other code, like here, Daphne has a piece of code that inserts data into a BigQuery table. BigQuery is um, Google Analytics, uh, a database uh, in um, Google that is especially good for analytics and uh, big data. So here, uh, Beth builds some simple code here that just pushes a, a message to PubSub. She doesn't need to know what sits on the other side. And then Daphne can write code that when this message comes through, she takes action on it and inserts data into BigQuery. What's cool with this is that not only do we have some separation here, but when Beth eventually goes out and hires other teams, like she might hire a, um, a, uh, a CRM team, a PR team, a uh, various other uh, teams, marketing that um, that also needs to know what jokes are sent to which users. They can just hang their stuff off of the uh, pubs of bus as well, and nothing needs to change in this production microservice down here. You can have multiple listeners for one type of message. So this is a great way of decoupling your systems when you're building something that is more than one developer on. All these, we can have one developer in, in this building this function, one developer building this, one building this, one building this. All they need to be in agreement on is what does a message look like? 
Let's have a look and see what that code looks like. We'll start with the code that is in Beth's microservice here that just publishes to the bus. Um, so here's the old reply function. Um, it calls get joke in an asynchronous way. So this code is, is uh, similar to what we've seen before. Here is actually the new code. Publish PubSub message. This is a function Beth writes herself, and we'll take a look at it in a minute. Uh, we send uh, the joke to it and the request body. When you work with Twilio, the request body will contain the phone number of the person who sent a message to you. So this call sends the joke and the phone number of the recipient. And then the code is, is very similar. It's actually the same to what we've seen before. OK, publish PubSub message. She just needs to add this one line, but she needs to define publish this function too. We'll have a quick look. This is what it looks like. It takes a joke and a phone number. Uh, this is a bit of uh, boilerplate code here. She needs to prepare the data that goes into the message. Daphne and Beth has agree have agreed that the data will be joke, phone number, and date. And then uh, she needs to create a PubSub instance. This is basically an API endpoint that you can call. She needs to create, she needs to create the message. And then here's how you post it. Joke sent here is the topic that will be used. So other services like Daphne's code can say, I want to listen to all messages that come through on the joke sent topic. So in a typical company, you would have many, many topics, of course. Great way of decoupling systems. Um, great way of sending, uh, uh, you can use this for sending machine data, uh, machine learning, training data between systems in a very loosely coupled way. So that systems don't need to know about each other. Let's look at this code. Uh, this is Daphne's code that receives the message and inserts the data, those three elements of data we saw, uh, the joke, the phone number, and the date, which puts those into a BigQuery uh, table. Uh, so here we are, post to BigQuery. All right. Uh, we would get a message and a context. Um, here is a bit of uh, uh, code that we'll do every time. This basically unpacks the message that comes through. So in the end, data will be uh, a, um, a JavaScript structure that has a joke, phone number, and a current date in it. OK, great. So uh, she's unpacked the message that came over the bus. Now uh, she will need to insert that data into BigQuery, into the big data database. So first, you will need to create the row you want to uh, uh, the row you um, you want to insert into the, the BigQuery database. Create a BigQuery object, like a sort of API gateway that uh, that you can call to insert. And this is how you insert it. Uh, you say dot dataset dot table dot insert and send uh, the row you want to insert. Done. We now have. A uh, fully decoupled system. We have an admin interface down here. We have exports here. We have a scalable database over here. We have users who can send text messages to the service and get jokes back. We have decoupled analytics. We have other uh, teams could get their decoupled data. Maybe there's a machine learning team up here who, uh, who are running analytics on, uh, on this data. And they uh, Beth doesn't need to know exactly how their code works because all she does is publish messages on this bus. And we have all this in less than 100 lines of code. This is what it means to focus on your code, not your infrastructure. All of the code we saw here, it's, it's code centric and you just deploy it with a single command line command. And there is no need to set up load balancers and uh, replicate databases and uh, have failover, hot spares, all that stuff. It just works because this runs on cloud functions. In this case, uh, the microservice called a, a uh, database, a Cloud SQL database. He could just as easily, you could use the Google APIs to call one of Google's machine learning APIs over here. For example, 
Alice might be able, we could have, um, she could send uh, MMS, these uh, text messages with uh, pictures in them, for example. They would arrive over here. This microservice could send uh, it over to the Vision Cloud, uh, Google's Vision API that could then return what this vision contains and return that to the user. Or call a custom um, a TensorFlow model or something else. It's all very easy to set up from JavaScript, as we just saw. There are, oh, let's talk about cost. Yeah. So let's say um, here are some assumptions. I, I assume that each, each call will take 200 milliseconds. It typically takes less than that I, when I built the service to try it out, but I counted 200 to be on the safe side. The Cloud SQL instance will cost between eight and $55 per month, depending on what's SLA and, and RAM and such that uh, Beth wants. She used Cloud SQL here because she's used to that. Uh, she could also have used Cloud Data Store, which is a NoSQL database, and then she would have paid far less. Twilio SMS cost is not included in this cost example because I don't work for Twilio, and if you're building a service that uses Twilio heavily, you should probably talk to them about a uh, negotiator rate with them. So um, I, I've, uh, I've broken out Twilio cost, I've broken out the database cost, and uh, let's see what these uh, hitting these um, cloud functions would cost. Let's say she gets a million hits per month, a million invocations, that is, um, um, users request a total of a million jokes. What would it cost? Actually, it would come on in for free because it would come in under the, uh, under the free tier. And then she would start paying more. Uh, let's say she gets 10 million invocations per month. She would pay something like $23 per month to run these cloud functions. So she could also, of course, have built a server or a server farm that is highly scalable and can deal with these requests that would building that server farm, renting those machines, uh, hiring somebody who can take care and patch of those servers and patch them and so on would probably cost more than $23 per month. So uh, cloud functions and serverless is a cost effective way of running uh, computing for many customers. Um, we see here, uh, here are some folks who have used uh, cloud functions. So we see, for example, serverless application backends. Yeah, serverless smart parking is a company uh, that uh, has all these IoT devices out in the field that make HTTP posts all the time about, in smart parking's case, it's actually about parking space XYZ is available or parking space XYZ has a car in it right now and keep sending those to their backend. Um, so with thousands of devices, you of course end up with millions of requests and you don't want to deal with a server farm that can take care of all those requests. Far better to use a serverless approach with cloud functions like that we just saw. Uh, Turner, they own uh, CNN.com. So they use this uh, cloud functions uh, for um, uh, internal uh, shuffling um, log data around. So CNN.com obviously has many, many front end web servers. They use cloud functions to push all of that, all those log servers to be consolidated to one single place where they can um, get it all uh, in one place and can analyze all the, all the data. Uh, they were actually able to, uh, with this uh, event-driven extract, transform, and load, they were actually able to get rid of a whole second server farm they had, a second server farm that did nothing but, but copying log data around between their servers. Now with Cloud Functions, they don't need to deal with maintaining that second server farm. We also see, and I've personally seen, a lot of developers use Cloud Functions for um, for conversational applications. So if you write an application for, um, uh, for Google Assistant, that uh, Google Assistant lives in your Android phone, it also lives in the Google Home speakers, then Cloud Functions works great for that. You don't have to set up servers and so on, and it's request response. It, that request response from a conversational app maps very nicely to uh, the request and response of Cloud Functions. With that, 
I'm happy to take your questions. I would love to hear uh, what you thought of uh, this talk as well, so I can make it better. I'd love to, uh, I invite you to submit a survey. Uh, I also invite you to actually use the service. If you send a text message to this address, uh, sorry, to this phone number, you should, if the service still works, uh, get uh, one uh, terrible dad joke back. And with that, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you, Modern. Uh, you guys feel free to leave the questions in the Q&A section. Yes, Q&A section. That's yes. exactly. Thank you for reminding me. Mm -hmm. I think the attendees are still processing the information you have present. <laughs> ah, yes, no problem. Let's see if I can put this in a way so that uh, I can see it and <laughs> I'm not hiding anything. That's bit.ly. I'll put the Q&A up there. Mm -hmm. um, also, while they're like still thinking what they should ask, I mean, uh, are there anything more you want to talk about? Maybe? I think that this, this cloud functions that we saw here mm -hmm. is um, it's serverless computing. When you hear people talk about serverless, this is what they mean. Uh, and um, uh, or, or they mean this kind of fun functionality either from Amazon or Google or Microsoft or one of the many others. I think this is the new way of computing. We've actually for years and years, and I've done this, I worked in startups where we did this, we worked very hard on solving uh, technology problems. That meant setting up servers, making sure they were highly available. We should have been working on solving business problems. And with serverless computing, you can do that because you don't need to worry about a power supply blowing up or about a patching uh, to a new version of uh, Linux or whatever you're running on your machine. Mm -hmm. Great. I think there's some question in the chat window, Martin. Oh, excellent. Let's go there. Uh, um, or let me put the questions in the q and I don't know if you can see. Let's see. I think I have a bit of a conflict of many uh, overlapping windows here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not able to get to it. Ah, there we go. Chat, chat, chat. Where is chat? Let's see. This is webinar chat, Q and A. Okay. So I, uh, I don't. Oh, so it was the chat window I had yeah. here. I don't see any questions in chat or Q and A. But if you see any, please uh, tell me. Oh, here are some. Oh my gosh, I missed the questions. Okay, uh, from. Um, you can ask. Okay, so the first question I see here is the Q and A section is going to start soon. Okay, that's not a question. Uh huh. Ah, the second one is how, how does it how does it compare to Microsoft Azure, Amazon Lambda functions? Yeah. So first, uh, excellent question. First off, it's uh, it's similar. So Azure and Amazon Lambda is similar things where they you send a request, um, get a response, and then there's no state between. Um, I would say I, I have not used Azure or Lambda. So uh, take this, um, so, so I can't speak in details about this. I do know that one major, um, uh, one major nice feature of Google Cloud Functions is that it's very simple to uh, call other things in the Google world. So for example, you saw here, we called a spreadsheet, a Google Sheet, super easy to do very easy to call uh, various Google machine learning APIs. And uh, I think that Google has a really good lineup of machine learning products. They're very easy to call from Cloud Functions. So it may actually be more about the ecosystem than the product itself. And I haven't used Azure and Lambda to give a detailed, uh, detailed uh, uh, comparison between them. Are non-public environment testing easy also? Oh, right. Uh, would that just add some auth tokens to the queries? Okay, great. So non-public, yeah. What if you um, want, this is a public function we saw here. Um, if you deploy a, a function, it is by default private. 
and you can then uh, give access to it to uh, in the in the cloud console. You give access to that function to certain groups. Uh, you can define groups of users. So. Um, so you could either roll your own, add auth, auth tokens, JWT, for example, or you can let Google take care of it if you have named users. And then you just, in the cloud console, you create groups, named groups of users. Um, would you add some more? Uh, what else? Yeah, I think, I hope that answers that question. Are cloud functions HIPAA compliant? Can they be used with healthcare apps and patient data? That is a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I know that parts of Google Cloud Platform became HIPAA compliant years and years ago. I don't know if Cloud Functions is among those. I'm sorry. Uh, a, uh, so like, uh, yeah, other, other parts of, cloud, of the Cloud Platform are, are compliant. Sorry, don't know. I need to look that up. What about writing tests and coordinating amongst a team of developers? Uh, are there cloud function aware IDEs? What about sharing libraries for shared types or something? Uh, okay, so we'll go, we'll, we'll do one at a time. So writing tests, I see two major different, different ways of handling this with testing. Some people say, uh, and I'm in that camp, uh, they say, okay, uh, that they say I want to test everything locally. So you would, uh, there is a Cloud Functions emulator that you can install on your machine. So you can run these Cloud Functions locally. Um, you would, uh, and, and then locally on your machine, and then you would test them there. You would typically have a, a test environment up in the cloud as well, where all the code goes into and you test it. Some people say, well, I have that test environment in the cloud anyway. I must have that anyway. So I might as well just test everything up there. So they test nothing locally. They don't bother installing the Cloud Functions emulator. And they have a, a second account um, or multiple accounts where they upload code. They can even have a continuous uh, deployment up to the test uh, environment up in the cloud where you can have automated tests running. By the way, Cloud Functions is a, is a very neat way of uh, automating things like that. You can, for example, say, whenever I have had code being checked into GitHub, you can tell GitHub, hit this URL. That URL can be a Cloud Functions URL. So you can, whenever somebody submits code, you could have a worker deploy that code to uh, your test environment, for example, and uh, trigger a bunch of uh, smoke tests. So Cloud Functions is great for that sort of gluing other pieces together. Okay, that was a, uh, sharing libraries. Okay, so when you deploy a function, this is sort of meant for um, microservices that are fairly independent of each other. Typically, you have like one team uh, works on one microservice. When you deploy a cloud function, the gcloud uh, command that you run bundles up your function and all its dependencies that sit on your machine and uploads it into the cloud. So each uh, library, each uh, function, each microservice can have this complete set of dependencies that can be different. So you could, of course, say, here's a shared type. Please, all developers, use this. Uh, and everybody would, when they deploy, that would be uh, bundled up with what they deploy. But they could also use different versions uh, of, uh, or maybe even different frameworks. It all gets bundled up and, and each function has its own complete dependencies bundled in, in it. Um, if your message example, multiple hard-coded schemas maintained by different people, that wouldn't be allowed on my team. Yep, good question. So oh, good. So I would, in this case, there would there probably a case here for in source control, you would have a, uh, a type that, uh, had, it contains these three data elements from this message. And team A, or um, Beth, she would, her code would depend on that, on that one file. She would uh, bundle, it would be, uh, she would have it from source control on her machine. It would automatically get bundled in when she deploys. 
And for Daphne, when she deploys, it would also be bundled in. She would get it from source control, the latest version, and it will be bundled in. I hope I answered uh, Joel's question there. The joke app works. I got the joke. <laughs> get out of here. We don't serve your type. <laughs> Excellent. Love it. <laughs> Uh, Samir, I just tried, I got the same joke. Excellent. Um, question from Daniel. Is there a recommended tutorial for cloud, Google Cloud Functions? Uh, yeah, so if you go to search for Google Cloud Functions, uh, they have quick start guides uh, that um, uh, there, there's a tutorial to a uh, hello world tutorial that is fairly quick to do. And then there are more advanced tutorials, like you can build your own uh, for example, uh, there's a tutorial how to connect with SQL databases. There's a tutorial for how to build a um, um, build a, a Slack command and, and various other things. So yeah, uh, search for Google Cloud Functions and, and there's actually some pretty good stuff there that uh, some good friends of mine who are, co uh, who are tech writers have written up. Which is a better architecture to call cloud functions directly from the web page or have an intermediate application tier on the back end? I think it, dep it depends. Um, depends on how much you want to expose your cloud functions, if you want them to be publicly visible or not, how much you want to lock them down. Um, you can use AppEG or uh, cloud endpoints, those are parts of the cloud. Um, uh, Google Cloud Platform. You can use that to to add a layer in front of your uh, of your cloud functions. I think it depends. In this case, I, I just didn't have anything sitting in front. <laughs> Got another joke. <laughs> What's the best thing about Switzerland? I don't know, but the flag is a big flag is a big plus. Yes. Will this presentation and code be made available for view download uh, later? Uh, yeah, Micah, could you address that? Yes, I just answered a question. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. You're way ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. All right. Well, thank you. How about the code? Um, yeah, uh, well, so I do have an action item that I need to um, to, sub uh, to send this code to, uh, to upload this code to GitHub. I've also written a blog post about this um, on the cloud, uh, Google Cloud uh, Platform blog. So what I, and the code is maybe a little easier to get from there. It uh, has a slightly different use case, but very similar to this. It also has a bit more code. There were a few things I skipped over here to keep it uh, within an hour. But what I will do is uh, when I send this to Micah so she can uh, distribute it, um, I will include the link to that blog post on the Google Cloud blog. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for delivering such a great talk today, and we are very glad to have you. Hope everyone have learned today. The webinar is going to end in five minutes. Thank you all for your time. Please check our website for more tech talks, and all the webinar are recommended on our YouTube channel. I will put a link in the chat window. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.